I'm Suyan Fan from CMU. Today I'm going to talk about what we did for the DRC. Um, in DRC, we need to uh, basically tackle a wide range of tasks from local motion to manipulation. And given the very short time frame, it makes a lot of sense if we can uh, you know, factor it into somewhat a two-stage problem. So for the higher level uh, controller part, we, can, we, we only need to focus on each individual task and don't worry about the full details of the robot. And then we can share a, a very share a common low-level full-body controller that will translate all those objectives into um, some somewhat reasonable behaviors on the robot. From a slightly more abstract view, uh, we can look at this problem as something that optimizes for the entire future, but doesn't necessarily do so on the on the full-body uh, robot model. So this uh, red line is my crude representation of some kind of a trajectory, of, a trajectory that's done by some uh, optimization procedure. And this uh, red dot here, uh, anyway, this red dot here is a slice of this trajectory, which is handed then to the uh, lower level controller that only uh, tries to track this red dot as closely as possible but do so on the entire on the full body robot considering all the constraints and stuff. Here's a quick video showing what we uh, had been working on for the DRC. Uh, this is the Alice robot climbing the toted cinder blocks. Um, apologize for the videos being too dark. Uh, and this is the ladder climbing one. Uh, it's repositioning its uh, right hand and then trying to shift center of mass to one foot and climb the treads and shift over again. This, by the way, all, both of these videos are taken at the uh, garage pit in the, in the Florida. This is the actual trial for the valve turning uh, task, I believe. The robot is um, trying to track the operators, basically uh, operators um, target position for the hands. This is the drill task. <coughs> a little bit on related stuff. Um, many people, especially in the, in the walking domain, has been trying to generate some kind of a, either center of mass motion or a ZMP trajectory. A very famous example would be uh, the preview control. And also in our own group, uh, Eric Whitman has been working on using full-blown dynamic programming but only on a simple, simplified models for the robot to generate a robust uh, walking policy. Oh, thanks. And there's also been um, work on using receding horizon control to uh, re-optimize for step location and timing on the fly. And everybody here is very familiar with this um, torque controlled uh, paradigm for uh, humanoid robots. Everyone has their own slightly different version of their QP, but I think we share a lot of commonality here. So a quick outline for the talk. I'm going to briefly talk about how we do our low-level controller, and then some, some notes on state estimation, and then I'll give a couple examples of how we do the high-level controllers and show some videos over there. And finally, some discussion part. Here's a block diagram for our system. Uh, this is the, we call it the high level controller or the task level of things. It takes, it takes user inputs and the uh, real robot states. The user inputs can be, for example, a sequence of footsteps uh, that a, a footstep planner handed to it, or something like um, uh, operator uh, commands from in, in a teleop sense. And then this high-level controller spits out a, a set of uh, objectives and their uh, corresponding constraints. In the walking case, this could be uh, how the center of mass moves, how the ZMP trajectory looks like. And uh, the constraints could be basically saying your ZMP has to be under your foot at all time, things like that. And then we uh, hand these objective and constraints to the low-level controller which in our case has two, two blocks, uh, one for inverse kinematics, one for inverse dynamics. Uh, the inverse kinematics is responsible for generating the uh, reference joint position and velocity, and inverse, kinematic, kin uh, inverse dynamics cranks out torques. We then hand these to the robot servos, and hopefully the robot does something reasonable with that. 
we use we use both inverse dynamics and inverse kinematics because we think inverse dynamics is important for generating basically compliant uh, compliant motions and it provides us more uh, robustness towards external perturbation. Uh, we added inverse kinematics in DRC uh, to uh, basically battle modeling error that's inevitable on the uh, real hardware. Both inverse kinematics and inverse dynamics are formulated as quadratic programs. Uh, they optimize for the current time step. Uh, they both use the uh, full-blown uh, floating-based model for the robot. We didn't try to simplify the model in, at this stage because we want to have total control of everything we can possibly care about. And also, if we have everything there, it's much easier for us to specify uh, constraints for them as well. Uh, that's, so basically, uh, different from everyone else here, I think, we uh, optimize everything at the, at the same time. Let me just check. Sure. Right. So I, I talk. I talk about it a little bit more. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, one thing to note is we kind of we we treated inverse dynamics and inverse kinematics as totally separate problems, like independently. We didn't try to couple them very well, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. So just one quick slide on the on the QP thing. We basically. Um, minimize this cost function here, subject to a bunch of constraints here. The cost function, if we look at the A matrix and B vector, we can decompose it into something like this. And for each row, it will be uh, trying to track one objective. For example, if we are trying to track some Cartesian uh, space motion, this A matrix, part of the A matrix will contain some kind of uh, Jacobian for that. And the, and the B vector here will be essentially the Cartesian motion that we're trying to track. So for inverse dynamics, uh, the unknowns we're trying to solve is uh, a combination of all the state accelerations, or the actuated joint torques, and all the contact forces. Um, the, desired, uh, the desired motions from the high-level controller are represented by uh, these things, uh, the desired position, desired velocity, and de desired acceleration. We then compute some kind of a target acceleration for the QP using a simple feedback here. Uh, essentially, the QP is trying to track this term as closely as possible. More about the cost function. Um, the cost fun we're, we're basically tracking a large num a set of uh, desired accelerations uh, given by the high-level controller and the feedback. And sometimes we track center of pressure. Sometimes we track um, weight distribution. Uh, these are these are somewhat task dependent. For example, in the uh, in the manipulation case, we don't really have a desired center of pressure to track. And in single support, there's really not a weight distribution there for walking. On the robot, we find that minimizing the changes in the torque uh, would reduce high frequency oscillations. So we also do something over there. there. Uh, there's low weight regularization terms to just keep the problem well conditioned. In terms of constraints, uh, we turn the equations of motions into equality constraints, but we do not treat the contacts as uh, equality constraints. So for, for example, if we're in, um, for example, for the contacts, uh, we treat them very similarly here, but give the uh, weights, but just basically give them a really high weight to penalize uh, motion there. We find that using soft constraints for contacts would make the problem uh, more stable and, and actually uh, helps us to solve it faster on fly. The inequality constraints are mostly things like center of pressure has to be under the foot. Um, and you can generate like huge torques. That's physically impossible. Yeah. So uh, I imagine that you have some objectives 
that are weighted much more heavily than other Correct. Yes. Are there any numerical issues with that? Um, sometimes, yeah. If you, if you crank the weights too, you know, too far apart, it falls apart sometimes, yeah. Which opens a follow-up question. Yeah. The question of weight drilling. You get all those weights in those objectives, right? Yeah. What's your I mean, experience slash robustness on that? I mean, it's a, I, would, I would give you a very unsatisfying common answer that's it's a, somewhat a black magic to some degree. So for, for our case, we, we had a walking controller, we had a ladder thing, we had a manipulation. They share some ways, but there's a slight difference. So, uh, so who's the master of the ways? That's you. Uh, I'm the master for walking. Eric was more you know, ladder climbing. He has his own ways for ladder climbing. <laughs> Uh, manipulation, we kind of, you know, ah, well, that's someone else's problem. <laughs> so we just give them away, and it seems to be working fine. So, so do you use the same thing for manipulation and you couple the lower part and the upper part of the body? No, we, we, the, the manipulation controller is, is like a stripped down version of my stuff and Eric's stuff. It just stands there, don't fall down, and move your hands around. And, uh, it's not. It's not a special, specially designed thing. But yeah. Anyway, um, so for inverse kinematics, um, we have a kind of funky way of doing it. I think it's very. It, it's similar to um, Mike Mystery's inverse kinematics, to some degree. Uh, we maintain the inverse kinematics block maintains its own internal state Q here. And the unknown for this QP is the velocity of that. So after each um, iteration of inverse, inverse kinematics, we integrate to we, in, we integrate this velocity to update the, the state. Basically, um, everything else is pretty much the same as our formulation for inverse dynamics. The only difference here is we don't use the real robust state here. Instead, we use the uh, the IK's internal state to do this feedback. Um, the inverse kinematics IK also tries to track this thing as closely as possible. So IK internal state means simply the direct kinematics prediction. Um, so this internal state, you can think of it as some, some, it's sort of like a duplicate of the real robust state. We initialize this to the real robust state at the beginning, but then this thing does whatever it does, and the real robot does whatever it does. We have some hacks. So if any, uh, let's say XIK, yeah. how do we conclude XIK? Is that direct kinematics? Yeah, direct, kinematics? yeah it's forward kinematics from it. So just forward kinematics? Yeah, just forward kinematics. Right. Which yeah, avoids the noise issues. Right? right, so we had some uh, hacks going around to uh, try to keep this thing from going insanity, basically. Um, but yeah, it boils down to uh, we leaky integrate something that pulls this part towards the real robust state at a much slower scale. So uh, for the state estimator, we uh, have a we have a very simple. Can just go back? Sure. I just like to figure these things out. Sure. So now, okay, we have inverse kinematics and inverse dynamics. So, yep. Um, how do they cooperate? They. I go back to. Cooperation later. Yeah, I go back to that later. Okay. Uh, but it, okay. So we don't deliberately try to do that in, now. Um, you could say in IK or ID try to you know bias whatever your answer towards the other thing, right? So for example, in IK you can say, okay, my reference uh, acceleration should be the acceleration from the inverse dynamics and do things like that. Uh, what we find empirically is that these things, the answers from this, from inverse kinematics and inverse dynamics, they're more or less consistent if they're not against any constraints. The reason for that, we think, is because the high-level controller would hand them consistent targets. And if they track well, then they're more or less consistent. Does that make sense? Complicated. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, uh, the short answer is we had 
three months, and we kind of, you know, hack something up. And this part is the giant ass hack. So, yeah. But you're passing down to the joint controllers desired position, desired velocities, and desired torques. Correct. So depending on how you choose your gains, you can bias one or the other. Is that the how gain? You, how you set the gains on that feedback controller? That's on Atlas. On Atlas, we try to turn the position gains. Um, as low as possible until it collapses. So that means then you're, you're, it's mostly the inverse dynamics that are generating the motion. For the stance foot, it's mostly the inverse dynamics. For the swing foot, it's mostly the uh, inverse kinematics, if that makes sense. If you just try to do inverse dynamics for the swing foot, the ankle would be like that and do weird ass stuff. But yeah. Um, yeah, basically heavy, heavily loaded joints are more inverse dynamics driven, and uh, lightly loaded joints are mostly inverse kinematics. OK, any other complaints? <laughs> comments. <laughs> comments, comments. Okay, so sure. <laughs> I, I, again, I'm just throwing stuff out. Sure. Anyway. Um, so you're saying that there's a lot of things that are going on here. QP problem of the inverse dynamics and you basically do operational space control, mm -hmm. you don't have as much control over the joint level. Yeah. And somehow your inverse kinematics approach potentially adds a level of stabilization to the joint level, which is quite beneficial in the light of modeling errors and all other kinds of stuff. Correct. So there is some, it's, it's a, there is a good intuition behind that. I'm not sure the way it's formalized. I, mm, it's graph, I, I agree. It's uh, the gut feeling is we need inverse kinematics somewhere. Yeah, there's its own story. Operational space control is really cool if everything is correct. Like yes, space. correct. And in practicality, it becomes a pain in the rear end. Right. Because you lose, basically, you have to compensate for all kinds of unmodeled errors mm -hmm. in a very abstract of mass PT yep. control gain. Yep. And that kills you partially since you don't even know how this thing is projected down to the individual joint. Yes. Right. So, so with your controller, if, <coughs> if you do have a perfect model and you do have perfect torque sources and everything's perfect, is it pretty much your inverse dynamic sets doing everything and your inverse kinematics is contributing? Right. So in VRC, we don't have this block right. at all. It's pretty much similar to what we did, yeah. Except, right. Except we would do um, just down to level of velocity, it's not position. It's mm -hmm. Right. So how do you guarantee that your state Q, IQ, Q, IQ area mm -hmm. is going to stay consistent with what the inverse dynamics try to do? Because here you have an integrator that might start to divert on you. Uh, they, so in, in the inverse dynamics, um, we're reusing the like state estimated state or something like that. Uh, the hack we had here is say, um, we kind of integrate the desired position of the foot towards the real foot. So leaky, 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 yeah, we leaky yeah. integrate that towards it. Yeah, we did, we did the exact same thing. <laughs> I'm wondering right. if there's a, maybe a, a clean way of writing it. Yeah. That right. There's no need to react, I, don't, I don't know, because in IK, you can't reset the state to match the real state, right? That, that would totally defeat the purpose of IK. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, you need some way of you know, slowly incorporating what's really happening in the physical world here at a much slower time scale, let's say. Um, the hack we had was just you know, leaky integrated. Yes? Can you comment on the gravity compensation? Gravity compensation, uh, we don't. That's sort of incorporated in the inverse dynamics thing. So the ID block is supposedly generating gravity compensation if nothing moves. If things accelerate, they generate more torques, basically. I guess so gravity compensation is not too much of a deal, since so that's where CAD models give you the most reliable information. E Unless something is attached to the thing which doesn't belong there, like some metal. Pipe. Which happens all the time. <laughs> But yeah, um, right. We, we, 
So we didn't really explicitly do gravity compensation. That's just part of the, what happens in the inverse dynamics block. So. OK. Can I go on now? I guess so. I haven't gone to the video slides yet, so. Uh, yeah, yeah. So for state estimator, we have very simple EKF for just the pelvis position and velocity. Uh, the IMU on Alice was pretty good for orientation and angular velocity estimates, so we didn't include those. Uh, the process model is based on IMU's acceleration uh, readings. And the observation model basically assumes uh, the contacts are not moving, and we know where the contacts happened. And then we just use forward kinematics to update the states. OK, video slides. Uh, this is what we had for the VRC. It walks up ramp, uh, stairs, and uh, walks. Uh, given a given footsteps. The cinder blocks here jumps around all the time. <laughs> that's, a, that's a gazebo artifact, but anyway, yeah. So for the VRC, we didn't have the inverse kinematics block. We, everything here is totally inverse dynamics driven. Um, without modeling errors, life would be so much better. So for this dynamic uh, walker, the high-level controller essentially uh, does trajectory optimization for a point mass model. It uses something called differential dynamic programming, uh, which is happy with uh, nonlinear models. For VRC, we uh, explicitly included the z direction for the point mass model because we uh, want to have a more principled way of doing uh, rough terrain or terrain with uh, height changes. That makes the model nonlinear, but DDP is OK with that. Um, we, we kind of think of this as a somewhat generalized version of the preview controller, as it also you know, optimizes into the future, uh, does a point mass model, and whatnot. The blue line here is showing the uh, center of mass trajectory after optimization. This is x versus time, y versus time, uh, z is height versus time. The red dots here are the uh, desired footsteps. Just gives you a kind of feel of uh, what it looks like. For uh, DRC, though, we kind of chicken out. We said, ah, OK, let's go slow. So we did this uh, slow, static walking thing. Um, different from pretty much everyone else, we didn't use lasers at all. We think lasers suck. Or our perception guy said, <laughs> or some some combination of that. <laughs> but anyways, I shouldn't say that. But yeah. Um, so what we did is we, you know, turned the camera all the way down to the foot, and we have to bend the torso to see enough of the foot, and then we basically uh, tally off around where the foot goes, you know, six in in the Cartesian space, how it's tilted and stuff like that, and then uh, when we're satisfied with. Uh, with the end position, we just say, OK, go with it. And that's why the uh, single support phase is so long. And you, you can... guys have the full 3D terrain model? No, we don't. No. But it's, I mean, it's in a well, box. It's, it's well known now. It's well known, so. so. This would not work at all for, you know, the cinder blocks would be anything else. Just one of four ways right. and just look up there and see the pattern. And then right. Oh, so you can hack the things out. Right. You have a lot of structural knowledge. Correct. Correct. Um, the other thing we figured out is toe off is necessary for doing the task, uh, doing the uh, terrain task. It's the way we did toe off is kind of hackish as well. We basically say inverse kinematics and inverse dynamics. The foot is allowed to pitch freely around the pitch axis. And in inverse dynamics, we constrain the uh, center of pressure to be at the toe. In inverse kinematics, we kind of bias the knee towards a bent configuration, so it would peel off naturally in the uh, IK solution. Uh, on the real robot, we think it's important to um, have perfect control over ZMP. So we uh, turn the stance ankles into purely torque control mode. Um, Just checking, what does it mean? Correct. 
So I turn off all the position gains for the ankles, basically. Um, and because the thing is going super slowly, we can run various integrators at different levels. Uh, one thing we find out is on the real robot, the uh, model's predicted center of mass is very different from the real one measured by uh, the foot sensors. So we run a center of mass integrator to compensate for that. Uh, the other thing is, since the ankle is purely torque controlled, um, the uh, position arrow will propagate all the way towards to the swing foot. Uh, that will make the swing foot tracking, um, that will basically introduce errors in the swing foot tracking. So we had to run another integrator to compensate for that. It's all kind of hacks here. OK, so ladder. Um, Strategically, it's very similar to the, the static walking thing we had. Uh, we didn't use any lasers. We had a camera looking at the foot when we we're repositioning foot. We had it look at the hands when it's you know repositioning hands. Oh, this dance here was because if we just go down like that, the, the back joint is too weak. It would just collapse. It's interesting. So you didn't use the 3D information at all from the lasers? No. Nope. Well, Chris was making that strong statement when I was visiting that you can just pack that up in half a day. What happened to this? <laughs> you can ask him. You can ask him later, privately. But yeah. But yeah. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> for for the foot being only partially on the step, mm -hmm. do you do um, something where you kind of tell the controller it only has part of the foot it can use. Right. And then, so you always try to have the front done? Yep. Like, yep. So we chop off the large part of the foot and just say you can use the toe part. Uh, yeah. I think the most important strategy here is, or the lessons we learn here is the arms suck, so we can't grab them onto the railings and we can't walk backwards. So we had to hook onto the treads and lean all the way back like that and then reposition the foot. Because otherwise, the, the shank will bump into the treads all the time if, if you have the center of mass over the, over the foot. Um, leaning back saved a lot, saved, uh, basically solved that problem for us. Um, this is fine until we ran off treads to hook on. And that's exactly what happened in DRC. <laughs> we went all the way to the top, and then there's nothing to hook on. So, uh, And we didn't have a plan for what to do with that. Uh, the thumbs at the hooks here, we try to use those to hook onto the side railings at the top. And uh, oh, here's Eric trying to abuse the robot. Uh, it's somewhat compliant, so it's OK if we push it around a little bit. But yeah, OK. Um, Another thing is we when, when uh, during tests, the robot would yaw sometimes because, especially during single support, because you only have like this much of support at the toe, and when the pad is like soaked in grease and it's aluminum on, you know, almost peeling off foot pads, it's very bad. It rotates all the time. So the solution we came up with is just intentionally lean on the railings to do, prevent it. Uh, we obviously have to maintain or manage uh, much more kinematic constraints here than in the uh, walking case. Here's a video showing the manipulation part. Uh, this guy here is trying to tally up using this somewhat joystick-like device um, to control the anti factor here. Um, he's trying to use the controller plus the joystick to turn the valve. Do you simulate, do you have latency and bandwidth constraints on this simulation, on this demo? In, at what level? The, the ones that they enforced in the DRC. The half second delay. Oh, that. Yeah. Uh, probably not. I don't think they have it for this. Yeah, I, that's, yeah. that's a good question. Mm. OK. Cool. So we find that this kind of two-stage setup was very nice. Um, it basically made it possible for developing multiple tasks at the same time. 
And the low-level full body controller seems to be relatively effective for all three tasks we are trying to solve. Um, so this question of inconsistency between inverse kinematics and inverse dynamics, as I said before, I can um, bias either solution towards the other if that makes everyone, it makes people feel happier. But <laughs> we think the real problem is, let's say, if you are really against some constraint, constraint surface, um, since all the IK and ID, they're only greedily optimizing for the current time step, and, and in, in a lot of cases, you kind of need to look into the future and see what's really the, the right way of going away from these constraints. So we just think uh, maybe this is really a problem for a high-level controller. So um, that's kind of my uh, remark on, uh, that's, that's basically my remark on this issue here. We, we don't really know what's the right way of solving this problem, or even our way of doing IK is, is, is a reasonable thing. Uh, but it, in, empirically, it seems um, pretty effective. So, yeah. Um, also, going slow made a lot of things much, much easier. We can run integrators at different levels. Uh, delays is just not so big a deal if everything moves so slowly anyway. Uh, we, d we do have to complain a lot about this uh, forward kinematics error um, because position and torque sensing were pre-transmission. Um, on the Sarkos robot, we had a lot better forward kinematics error than uh, on the Alice robot. So f the one uh, experiment we did was basically clamp both foot together onto a piece of wood and just rotate it around. We get up to like seven centimeters um, distance between each foot. So it was pretty bad in some way. Just checking, okay, torque sensing or pre-transmission? I know you guys have pressure sensors in the, in the service. Right. The position sensing pre-transmission, what transmission is there? Uh, it has these rod things. So the linkages? The linkages. Yeah. It's not, it's I'm not. Rigid like with, with, I mean, no. you no? Yeah, yeah, I yep. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty well, pretty good compared to most robots out there. Still, still so these are these like a four-bar linkage system. Yeah. Yeah, especially on so much more parts. Right. It, it, it's a little more complicated than that. They, they use a similar mechanism to what a lot of tractors uh, have, so that you get uh, they actually have a, a reverse gear ratio effectively going out. So the motion of the cylinder is amplified going into the joint to get them a larger range of motion. Yes. yes. That that means that you end up with uh, like six different bushing sets in, in the knee, I believe. So it, it, it has a good bit more backlash than you would like, and the encoders are built in parallel with the cylinders themselves. Got it. Okay. So, yeah. Can you comment on the game selection, since you have so many controllers running? Uh, yeah, the games here was... Um, so we had a lot of options with the gains, and we ended up just using these four. The first two are position and velocity. Just, just explain to those who have not an atlas. Um, so the okay. servos, are these the valves? Yeah, these are the valves. The valve controllers? Yes, the valve controllers. So K, Q, <laughs> sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is position okay, so in radians of, of the joint angle. Of the joint angle. So this right. Yeah. Is the, is the uh, yeah, F is force. This is the joint velocity term. Joint, yeah, velocity term. Uh, FFQD. FFQD, I think it works. It, it's, it's, it's a few word forward for the velocity. Because it's so, so of the joint or the piston? Of the piston. So, of the piston. Right, so servo valves are good at velocity control, right? The current is proportional yeah. to the velocity. So if you don't have a FF2D, you're just, you know, just fighting that. Um, so that's where, you know, given the, yes, given the velocity that, that the piston is currently moving at, we want the current to just keep it so it keeps. Yeah, yeah, I was not interested in the joint servos. I was interested in the high-level servos. Okay. So how? <coughs> yeah. um, 
the next thing I was going to say is I didn't spend too much time on this, so uh, yeah. Right. Yes. Uh huh. Uh, you you can't make them too high. Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, basically, what we found is that as we would we would have wanted to make that gain higher. Right. We could without putting extremely aggressive filters. Those. Right. So, so towards the end, we had we had uh, the uh, capability of putting custom filters on the on the robot. We we didn't end up using that as well. I don't know if other people have tried it. Um, it would be very interesting to hear about remarks on those. But, yeah. Um, any other questions? OK. So for the next stage, we would like to go faster. But to go faster, we need better models or better state estimator or something like that. Um, we're still pondering on how to exactly deal with those. Um, for for high level controller, we'd like to incorporate angular momentum uh, into our model. Right now, it's just point mass. We, we don't we don't reason about angular momentum at all. We think that will help a lot for uh, balancing. And for dynamic walking, we think uh, reoptimizing step time and location will be uh, very helpful. It's getting close to uh, some kind of a push recovery scenario in the walking case. In the in terms of low level controller. Um, this uh, coordination between IK and ID is still a problem. We still have to uh, think about what's the right way of doing that. And we think it's a good idea to you know, inject some notion of future into the QPs so that they won't be just greedily optimizing. One way would be you know, send it some kind of a value function or VXX in some way and have the QPs optimize for those as well. Um, and, and Chris is always saying, you know, nothing is really Tor controlled. Everything is valve command controlled. So we should be optimizing for valve commands instead. Uh, maybe that's a good idea, maybe not. That will bring us to, you know, a third order model in the inverse dynamics. And uh, um, it will be interesting to see what happens over there. So I, I, I yeah. know that valve command corresponds to some relationship between velocity and force. Um, we tend to think it is a, a torque dial in some way. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember what the, for, what the formula is. It, it's it's uh, flow. No, it, it's not flow because if you increase the amount of force that you're applying, the flow decreases. We're related to the differential pressure. Yes. yes so, but uh, no, no, it, it's not even that. The, uh, if you increase the the valve command or whatever, you get an uh, increase in velocity if your force is held constant. Yes. But if your force if your force changes, you can you also have to increase that valve command in order to keep the same velocity. So it's a it's a relationship between the two and I'm trying to remember what it was. I think one of them squared and you're multiplying them, but I, I can't remember what the what the, the rough one is. I mean, you, you're essentially saying how wide you want the valve open. So how yeah. many orifices, and then, so then it's just the resistance, so that the flow is related to the pressure drop. Yeah, I, I know I know Sebastian went through all this with Fast Runner, but I, I can't remember what the actual equation is. Well, yeah, but trying to control force through the valve flow is really hard to do because the, the relationship is so finicky, whereas velocity is really direct. So they're awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the two influence each other, but velocity has primacy because that's, that is what, where the viscosity of the fluid comes into play as you're going through that orifice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, I think that's all I have.